Hello, everybody, and thank you for tuning in today to the Liberty Report. With me today is Daniel McAdams. Daniel, good to see you. Good morning, Dr. Paul. Well, very good. Daniel, we have a special guest today and somebody you have visited with in the past, and she is calling in from Aleppo. Wow. So this is on-the-scene reporting. This is fantastic. Her name is Vanessa Beeling, and she's a journalist at Travel, and she's independent but she's also willing to tell the truth, which makes her unique among journalists and why we are delighted to have her on the program because that's what we specialize in is trying to seek out the truth and sort out all the fiction and all the fake stories, but no fake stories today. Vanessa, welcome to our program. Oh, I thank you so much, Dr. Paul. And just to let you know, I actually returned from Aleppo last night. I'm now back in Damascus, but I was in, in Aleppo for three days. You're in Damascus, okay. That's yeah. pretty close. Yeah. <laughs> I understand that country is not all that big. That, that's probably like you're still in Texas you know, <laughs> when you go there. <laughs> well, well, anyway, we know that you've been there a while, and we know that you're one of the rare, if not the rarest, individual who will go into a situation like it was in Aleppo. Actually, I think you were in Eastern Aleppo. And uh, we're real interested in that. Our audience is very interested in this to getting some real news and, and real facts. So if you could give us an update about uh, what you did uh, last couple weeks and, uh, and exactly what's going on in Aleppo, because the most of the, what we're reading now in our press is uh, the evacuation. It's on again, off again. How are we going to protect these people? And who's on whose side? You know, that sort of thing. So if you could give us an update on that, uh, I think uh, that will be well appreciated. Sure. Um, basically, I spent uh, three days in, as you said, East Aleppo, in the um, all the areas that had been liberated, um, the old city in Aleppo, the uh, area of Hanano. We went to literally just two or three days after its uh, final liberation, and so we spoke to civilians in that area, literally, who were who were finally liberated from. Um, the various terrorist factions led by Nusra Front, but including factions like Nor al Dinsinki and Ar al Sham, um, those two, of course, have not been designated terrorist um, groups by the United States, despite Nor al Dinsinki having beheaded the 12 year old Palestinian boy, Abdullah Issa, a few months ago. Um, but those were the main groups that were um, embedded in East Aleppo and basically imprisoning the civilians. Um, everybody that we spoke to um, in those two areas, um, or, or who had managed to leave those two areas, um, told us of the atrocities that were carried out by these terrorist groups. Um, one woman explained to us on film uh, that they had, just before the liberation, they had um, basically imprisoned her eight-year-old daughter. Her eldest daughter um, was marked for rape. Um, and literally, the only thing that saved her was the day that uh, the Syrian Arab army liberated her nano, was the day that, that the eldest daughter was going to be taken. Um, the eight-year-old daughter uh, died in prison, um, by the way. She also told us of the fact that um, it was the terrorists who were firing upon civilians trying to leave via the humanitarian corridors that were set up by the Syrians, Syrian government and the Russians. Um, and she she told a woman in particular who was trying to escape, um, fell on the floor, in she was starving. Um, another thing that was made very clear by all of the testimonies was that the terrorists had been receiving humanitarian aid, including food and medicines, but they'd been stockpiling it and basically rationing it to the, the civilians, to the civilians also doing it at extortionate prices, most of which, most of the civilians couldn't afford it. Um, this particular woman fell on her knees in front of the terrorists and she begged for food and they shot her in the mouth. Um, this was only one story of, of the horrendous atrocities that we were told about, of summary executions if anybody expressed any allegiance to the Syrian government or even to the Syrian army. Um, um, 
members of the Syrian Arab army, if they were discovered, they were summarily executed by the terrorist factions. Mm. Schools were taken over and used as weapon stores or as training grounds or Sharia courtrooms um, by the terrorists. In fact, we were approached by the director of one of the schools in Hanano, who very proudly said to us that only three days after the liberation, they had volunteers had cleaned out the school and they were going to welcome children back into it in the next sort of 24 hours. He showed us around the school. He showed us the, the Nusra flags that had been left there, um, the graffiti on the wall, the, the bullet holes in the courtyard where they'd been using it for, for weapons training and also where the fights had taken place. Another thing to be very clear about, particularly in Hanano, the damage to the buildings was very much um, in line with ground fighting, not the aerial bombing that everybody has been amplifying, particularly in Western media. The buildings were not collapsed from the roof down, which is what you would see uh, under a bombing campaign. They were basically um, holed by sh mortar fire or shell fire. And in fact, many of the civilians told us that the terrorists had been using chemical weapons on the civilians in West Aleppo, but also in East Aleppo. So these incredible testimonies that are pouring out with the liberated people these areas are completely undermining the mainstream media narrative for the last four years. And I think that is why we're seeing at the moment this incredible almost hysteria um, from Western media sort of ramping up these incredible stories of um, Syrian Arab army executions. Now, one very big point I want to make here, in Hanano in particular, we met with Syrian Arab army um, soldiers who actually had family in Hanano. They hadn't seen them for five years during the occupation by the terrorist factions. Um, these guys were, were extremely emotional to be able to, one, see their families again, but also to be able to return to their homes. So I would ask anybody to explain why uh, Syrian Arab army, exactly the same as the United States army, who have family across Syria, would be executing their own family in the area that they grew up in, where they spent their childhood, where they went to school, where their families have lived um, all their lives. It, it, it makes, you know, it's an obscene um, report that is being, that is being disseminated. Um, to the public at the moment. It's obscene. Uh, Vanessa, uh, Daniel has a question here for you. I was mm. going to say, Vanessa, uh, this may shock you, but the news we're getting here from Western sources is slightly different than what you're telling us, as I would say probably diametrically opposed. Uh, they talk about death squads ro roaming around, uh, army death squads, people desperately burning their belongings so they're not looted before they, uh, before they escape. What kinds of sources are they using? Where are they getting these stories from that really do dominate the Western coverage? Well, I mean, this is another extraordinary thing, Daniel. We've covered the White Helmets uh, in the previous program. Um, very interesting. All of the civilians that I spoke to, both in Hanano and in Jibreen, which was almost the collecting center for people leaving the eastern districts to come and register um, to, to undergo a sort of a medical examination, none of these um, civilians had received any medical treatment from the terrorists in the four years of their imprisonment. This is a very important point to make because we've heard time and time and time again about the last hospital, the last doctor, um, the last activist, the last, you know, the last everything. And the, the narrative has been very much the Syrian and Russian bombing of hospitals. But these hospitals, from all the testimony that we're receiving across all the eastern districts, were occupied by terrorist factions. They were used only to treat terrorists. No medicine was made available for the civilians, and no civilians were treated. Even one woman showed me uh, a bullet that had gone through her hand and, and lodged in her hand and had caused an awful scar. And she said basically she'd never dared go to the hospital to be treated because she was so terrified of what the terrorists would do to her and her family had she gone. And this is only one of, of the, the testimonies. I have to stress this. It's one after another. Um, and the very interesting thing, I asked all of these civilians if they knew of the white helmets, if they had come across them. All of them said no, they had never seen them. One person said to me, yes, he knew of the, Syria, of the civil defense 
defense, but he said they were the civil defense of the terrorist groups. He said they didn't treat civilians. Now, Lizzie Phelan of RT interviewed civilians in the same areas as I did in the last few days, and she actually received testimony that the white helmets had actually left people under the rubble to mm -hmm. die. And there was one man who told them that um, the white helmets had killed his daughter when he took her into the hospital. Now, none of these stories obviously have been fully corroborated but when you're receiving 90 percent of the of the testimony is telling you that one the white helmets did not operate in eastern aleppo two the hospitals were occupied solely and exclusively by terrorists and were only treating terrorists and that medicines were i mean this 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 um reduces the mainstream media Media narrative, the UN narrative, and the US government and the UK government right. narrative down to absolute obscenity. Mm -hmm. uh, Vanessa, I want to uh, see if I can get the picture here. Uh, the war's been going on a long time. We've been, yes. uh, uh, the news has not been beneficial to the average person to understand this. Uh, you're describing a real mess over there and tragedy and, and a description of us not getting the message. But it, to me, uh, a significant event has occurred. Aleppo has been taken over by the Syrian government. And, of course, uh, that indicates that uh, our side, the American side, uh, isn't doing so well. But how significant is this? Are you getting to the point where you say, you know, this is major, this is beneficial, this is the road to peace, this is, this is uh, we can look forward to it. Is this just a little blip going in the right direction, or is this a major change where you can expect uh, significant di uh, changes throughout the whole country of Syria? Yeah, I mean, honestly, this the, the victory of the Syrian government in liberating and retaking Aleppo um, is, is huge. Symbolically, Aleppo for me represented exactly what is happening in Syria as a whole. 75% of Aleppo in West Aleppo had been dehumanized, marginalized and ignored by the mainstream media and by the Western governments. Um, and the 25% of Aleppo, which was majority foreign militants, and terrorist groups was being amplified by the media and our governments. And this is exactly what is happening in Syria. The majority voice is being ignored in favor of those who are supporting um, U.S. intervention and U.S. Uh, regime change objectives inside Syria. So the liberation of Aleppo and the, the unifying, again, of East and West back into one homogenous city and the, the 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 repairing of links between east and west in aleppo is is huge and it, it's a massive um seismic paradigm shift because it has exposed the western media as the charlatans they are it has exposed our governments for exactly the objectives that they have in Syria and how they're trying to achieve it. You know, we've we've seen the British, primarily British funded shadow state project, particularly the White Helmets, being exposed again as frauds and liars and potential murderers from the testimony that we're getting. Right. This is in US. Okay, Daniel has a follow up. Yeah, this is this is this is something that unfortunately I'm sure you have to deal with. Dr. Paul had to deal with it for all the wars that he opposes. <laughs> Uh, you know, and it's never asked of the mainstream journalists, but you know, I do follow you on social media and you do have, mm -hmm. believe it or not, you have a lot of detractors <laughs> and they say that, oh, uh, you are Assad's... She's doing her job right. <laughs> <laughs> you're Assad's mouthpiece, uh, you're, you're doing the business of Assad, you're on his payroll, all of these sorts of things that are flung at people. What do you say to people who say that about you as a journalist? There, it's pretty unusual to have a journalist in, in the area. Yeah, I mean, um, you know, as soon as an attack becomes ad hominem, I feel that they've lost the argument. Because if people are going to start using campism arguments, in other words, I'm a Sadist or I'm Putinist or I'm Nasrallahist or um, whatever else I can think of, um, it's ridiculous. If I'm going to call myself anything, I'm a truthist. I'm completely self-funded. I do what I do because I believe in exposing injustice wherever it is. Now, people may be... May be don't like that you know it makes them feel threatened and maybe they're projecting their own um sell out to whatever um faction that, that's involved in this regime change operation inside syria um that's their problem but as i said as soon as it becomes an ad hominem attack as soon as they attack me instead of attacking my arguments instead of debating my conclusions 
then they've lost the argument. So for me, again, this is this is an example. The, the more that they come at me, it's an example of, of the damage that we're doing. You know, the hyperbole is, is being is being exposed. And right. they are losing the war on all fronts. Yeah. They're losing the war militarily in Syria. They're, us they're losing the war politically, diplomatically. And now on the propaganda front, they've completely lost it. We're going to see a complete shift. You know, we've had the attacks on the fake news, but we are actually exposing the fake news for what it is. Well, we have a lot of work to do, but I'm glad to hear some of the optimism you have here because that's our goal. But, you know, if mm -hmm. you go and ask the average American on the street about uh, Aleppo or Syria, they, say they might know a little bit. There's a problem over there, but it's all Russia's fault. If the Russians had just stayed out, there wouldn't be a problem. There's very few. There's a growing number, and, of course, we reach these people that it has something to do uh, with America. But if you go on to the streets of Aleppo, uh, what would the people say, uh, you know, about Americans? Are they aware of the big picture, the big policy? and uh, who the factions are and what do they uh, what do they think of Americans do they do they know that we're part of the coalition that would like to uh, and have been for five years uh, trying to get rid of the uh, current uh, government of Syria yeah um, the majority of Syrians are very aware of um, the the intervention policy of the United States they are very generous in the sense that they consider that it is only the U.S. administration that is to blame. They don't blame the American people. Um, and that is always made very, you know, that point is made very clearly in the hospital. I, I actually went into Syria in July with the U.S. Peace Council, and they were all incredibly impressed by the hospitality and generosity that was accorded to them by the Syrian people, despite what the U.S. government is responsible for, the, the, the misery and suffering that it's inflicting upon the Syrian people. Um, so from that perspective, um, there was a lot of optimism uh, when Hillary Clinton was not elected, because I think there was a lot of fear that had she been elected, um, you know, we would pretty much be going to war, or certainly we'd be, we'd be way closer to the brink of it than we are at the moment with Trump. Um, so there was a huge sense of optimism from that also. Just going back to the Russian perspective, um, let's be very clear here, Russia was um, legally invited into Syria by the elected government, unlike the United States that is intervening illegally um, and is carrying out war crimes, as in the bombing of the Syrian Arab army soldiers in Deir ez-Zor a few months ago, or a couple of months ago, for example. Um, and Russia, you know, I was in East Aleppo. I went to Jibreen, which, as I say, was the registration center for civilians leaving East Aleppo. I was allowed to go in and film in the Russian field hospitals that had been set up there by Russian medics to attend to all of the civilians that were coming in. And they said on average they were seeing about 150 a day with various injuries from unhealed, broken bones. I saw um, a young man in there who was emaciated, could barely breathe, um, and was skin and bones. And they were treating him so kindly. Um, the humanitarian effort by Russia inside Syria is never ever, ever reported in Western media. It's extraordinary. You know, uh, Vanessa, uh, State Department spokesman John Kirby said, I think it was yesterday, I didn't see any celebration in Aleppo uh, when it was liberated. I didn't see any pictures of it. Uh, did you see any? Of course I did. I mean, people were out on the streets, particularly after the old city was um, liberated. This was extraordinary. I mean, that night we actually got into a taxi and the taxi driver was crying. We filmed him. We, we actually interviewed him and he was weeping. And he said, this is, you know, maybe this is an end to the hell that we've, we've been living under. Because another point to make is that the, the terrorist factions funded by the United States uh, coalition in East Aleppo were daily firing mortars and missiles and explosive bullets. That it was happening when we were there in the area we were. The explosive bullets were hitting um, within meters of where we were staying, as were the mortars. And children, I mean, thousands of children have been eviscerated, mutilated, lost arms and legs as a result of these mortar attacks that, again, have never, ever been highlighted in Western media. And today I was 
told. It's unconfirmed reports, but I was told that in the area that has just been evacuated um, of the remaining militants in East Aleppo, they have found huge stores of missiles, including possibly grad missiles. So again, this points to, you know, the, the, the absolute uh, hypocrisy of the United States, who has been arming these terrorist factions in order to massacre not Syrian Arab army, which would be logical. If, there, if there's a civil war in Syria, you would expect these so-called rebels, rebels to be using these missiles against the Syrian Arab army, but no, they're using it them against civilians. I mean, you know, this is, it, it's disgusting. Uh, Vanessa, you know, you, <clears throat> you've been involved in this for a while. I'd like to know a little bit about how you got involved in this type of journalism, this desire to get the truth out. Have you been doing this for a long time or did you have an epiphany somewhere along the way? Uh, tell us how you got, you had, where did you achieve this determination? I grew up, my father was British ambassador um, to various countries in the Middle East. So I actually grew up in the Middle East as a child. Um, and I obviously spent my life with him. Um, and he was always throughout his career, and even when he retired, working on behalf of the Palestinian cause. Um, so about four or five years ago, having sort of... Um, studied his papers after his death in, in 2000, 2000. Um, I decided to, to go to Gaza. I lived in Gaza during the 2012 um, Israeli bombing. I lived there again in 2013. And during that time, I also then developed the interest in what was happening in Syria. Um, and it, it sort of snowballed from there. And I, I think that sense of um, wanting to expose injustice probably came very strongly from my father and has, has been part of my life, all of my life, but has been focused on the Middle East in the last four or five years. More time yet, and I think Daniel has a short question and then we'll be uh, thinking about, uh, you know, finishing up. Well, go ahead, Daniel. Yeah, I was just uh, I was just watching a clip earlier today from Democracy Now, which has been mixed at best on Syria. Let's put it that way. But they had a debate between Ken Roth of Human Rights Watch uh, and Professor Stephen Cohen of New York University, of two very very different perspectives, uh, and it was a fascinating uh, uh, debate. But here, what Ken Roth said, I think, is what you and I heard when we had an interview together yesterday, and we've heard it a lot, which is that the Russians and the Syrians have gotten together with the intent of bombing civilians in Syria. And no one has ever explained how that makes sense. If the Russians, if the Russian government just felt like killing a bunch of people, surely they could do it closer to home at a lot <laughs> lower cost. So it, it just defies logic that this is the dominant theme uh, in, in, in American thinking about Syria. <laughs> Well, exactly, Daniel. And, and you know, if, if the Syrian government's intent were to bomb its own civilians, why is it not continuing to do that now that the militants have been evacuated? Instead, it's taken in around 95,000 civilians from East Aleppo in the last um, few weeks, all of whom have been registered, all of whom have been medically treated, all of whom have been either reunited with their families in West Aleppo or um, sent into the internally displaced people camps to be then moved on to, to housing and until their homes can be rebuilt. I mean, we've seen, again, in, when I was in Aleppo, I saw tremendous projects going on to rebuild the areas that have been liberated almost immediately. We saw diggers and um, earth movers out clearing up the streets in Hanano. We saw the school as I mentioned, being opened again so children could get back into education, an education that they've been deprived of by the terrorist factions for the last four years. And across Aleppo and across Syria, we see this all the time. In areas where, um, which have been liberated from terrorist occupation, we see massive efforts from the Syrian state to rebuild, to rehome. There's a reason that 90% of IDPs, internally displaced people, which is over 6 million, um, have headed for government held areas. Now, if, you know, if the government were to be bombing its own people, why is it then taking in the, the people that the U.S. claims it's bombing into government held areas? Like, you, <laughs> right. I mean, it, it, just, it, it, it sort of beggars belief. It so defies logic and rationale. <laughs> 
Vanessa, this has been great. Uh, it's, it's so delightful to have somebody answering some of these fake news stories and getting some real news. And you may be the only one, if, you're, if there are more, there aren't very many, to really get some news out here, which is, is trying to level with the people of the world, not just uh, our audience, to level with people on what's going on. So we want to really thank you uh, uh, for this. But I want to ask you... Uh, uh, another one short question is, you said you're self-funded, and mm. uh, I don't know whether you take donations or not, but you're free to give uh, an address out, and because I would encourage people to support your efforts, because if people want to deal with fake news, they need to help people like you uh, to get the real news out. Uh, could you give us a little information on that? That's very kind of you, Dr. Paul. Yes, actually, I do have a donation button on my blog page, which is thewallwillfall.org, um, if people would like to donate. I mean, I literally do self-fund. Um, I sort of gave up pretty much everything at the beginning of this year to be able to focus on doing what I do. Another thing that I'd like to point out, a very dear colleague of mine, another very brave journalist, Ava Bartlett, is currently touring the United States, um, speaking on her time in Aleppo and Syria. Um, during this year she spent extensive time as i have in um aleppo and uh, the rest of syria so if anybody is um in the areas that she's speaking in please do go and see her she's she's also an amazing um truth bringer wonderful and i'm sure daniel will uh join me in this and thanking you very much for being with us and helping us get a message out which we think is so important thank you thank you so much both of you and I want to thank our audience uh, for being with us today. I consider this a very important program because our goal is to get real news out there and try to counteract the mainstream media. But uh, she gave us a lot of information about what's really going on in Syria, especially in Aleppo. And it's not uh, removed. If you look at most of the news story, they come from Beirut. It's not they, that they might have a glimpse on what's going on in Beirut, but let, let me tell you, it's nothing like spending time on the ground in East Aleppo and talking to these people and sorting out who was doing the uh, killing and the fighting and uh, having an honest assessment. So I want to thank our audience very much uh, uh, for joining us today, and uh, please come back to the Ron Paul Liberty Report soon.